Thank you, bell ringers. Uh, Alan, I was hoping you'd play the chimes every time I make a good point during the message, just kind of. <laughs> That was mesmerizing, man. That was great. All right. Thank you, Bell Choir. That was great. Thank you, uh, Wileen, for directing them. Wileen, you're just awesome. Thank you for bringing them, them together. If anyone would like to be a part of it, Wileen's always looking for new bell ringers to help out or be a substitute. So see Wileen if you'd like to be a part of it. We're going to be in Acts chapter 10 today, so I'm going to invite you to turn there. Um, we're not going to read it until a little later on in the message, so if you just find it and put a bookmark there, you can close it, put a finger there, whatever you need to do, uh, because there's some, some context to the passage here from Acts chapter 10 that uh, we need to, to go over. The title of the message today is, I Now Realize. I now realize. I wonder if you've ever had a moment in your life where you just now realized something that you didn't know before. And so before we read the passage, let's dig into some of the context. After Jesus' resurrection and ascension, the, the good news of Jesus' resurrection, the good news of forgiveness of sins, and the good news of Jesus' lordship over all peoples, was being shared far and wide, as far as the disciples could go. They were told to start in Jerusalem and then spread out and, and share the good news of Jesus with everyone. And this message was for both Jews and Gentiles. So when you read the scriptures, there's only two groups of people. There's Jews and there's Gentiles, according to the biblical view of things. And so through Jesus, now God has initiated one new family. One human race that doesn't exclude based on ethnicity or social or economic status. And this was and this still is a radically difficult message to preach. A radical different message to declare. And so in Acts chapter 10, we are going to find here in just a little bit the story of one of Jesus' most well-known disciples, Peter. He had some very deeply held assumptions about God's love for outsiders that was challenged and absolutely shattered. So the story is, is going to begin, and so this is your background context here in, in, in Acts 10. The story begins with an outsider, and his name is Cornelius. And Cornelius was a Gentile, so he's a non-Jew. And to muddy the waters just a little bit more, Cornelius was a Roman centurion. So he was a commander, he was a leader in the godless Roman Empire army that they occupied the Holy Land and they helped put Jesus to death. And so Cornelius is an outsider. But the story in Acts 10 begins with a detail that sort of breaks down the stereotype of Cornelius, as it says in Acts 10, 2, that he, Cornelius, and his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need, and he prayed to God regularly. So Cornelius was a non-Jew whose family worshipped Yahweh, at least what they knew of Yahweh. And so Cornelius and his family, they were not a part of the covenantal community. And the scriptures basically say they, they divide it out by those who were circumcised or those who were uncircumcised. And Cornelius and his family as Gentiles were uncircumcised. And so they didn't have an in with the covenantal community. But what they knew about God, based on what, you know, they, they, must have, they lived in close proximity to Jewish people. And so their proximity to the Jewish people and their worship of Yahweh was enough for Cornelius and his family to say, we want to worship Yahweh as the one true God. And so as imperfect as it was, and with all of, without all of the full details, and without full inclusion into the covenant community, Cornelius and his family worshiped God as they knew best. Even though there were holes in their understanding of who God was, there was a gap in what Cornelius knew about God. 
And now that Jesus has come and lived his life and Jesus has ascended, there is now a gap in, in what Cornelius and his family know about God being revealed perfectly and fully in the person of Jesus. And so here's the question, who better to tell Cornelius about Jesus than Peter? We could say arguably Peter probably knew Jesus more than any of the other disciples. And so it's important that while Peter is going to be sent to go to Cornelius, to give some revelation to Cornelius about God in the person of Jesus Christ, it wasn't just Cornelius who needed to learn something new. We're going to find that Peter, in fact, he had to learn something new for himself. Now, one of the, the buzzwords in society right now, perhaps you've heard this word, is the word deconstruction. Has anyone heard the word deconstruction anywhere on social media? Or maybe you have someone in your family or a friend who talks about deconstructing from perhaps the Christian faith. It's a word that usually describes a change in shifting or a, a complete abandoning of long-held religious beliefs, but it could also be beliefs about anything that we hold uh, dear. Now, I think it's unfortunate that the idea of deconstruction has taken on such negative baggage because, friends, deconstruction isn't a new fad. Can I just say that today? Deconstruction isn't a new fad, and it isn't always a bad thing. Now, where deconstruction needs to be challenged is when it leads to a sort of vacuum or void of thoughts and belief. Uh, deconstruction is unhealthy if it leads someone to ultimately say there is no truth or we can't know anything about God or the nature of life and human purpose. But I would argue that probably most people in this room, most of us in this room, have deconstructed over the years a few ideas, a few thoughts, and a few beliefs at one time or another. That is, unless I'm talking to a room full of perfect people who've never had thoughts or beliefs in your life that needed changing. Is there anyone in here today that would dare, ra oh, you're Ron, just about. Oh, yeah, right. So where, where deconstruction is good and healthy is when it makes room for a new structure to be built upon a foundation of truth. And that's precisely what happens here in Acts chapter 10 and specifically for Peter. This is not just the story of Cornelius and his family being given this full revelation of God in the person of Jesus. It's also the story of Peter's, we can say, deconstruction. And it, was, it wasn't a process that took many years for Peter to come to a new conclusion. It was just a matter of maybe a day or two for Peter to de deconstruct some, some unhealthy thoughts to what God wanted him to believe. So, God appears to Cornelius in a vision, telling him to seek out Peter. And Cornelius had never met Peter before, but God gave Cornelius Peter's coordinates. He said he's in Joppa. He's staying at the house of Simon the Tanner. And so he told Cornelius, send out some people, send out a search party to go find Peter and bring Peter back to your house. Now, God doesn't tell Cornelius why Peter was supposed to go to his house, but in the text, it says that Cornelius was a God-fearer. And so he just, he simply just did as God told him to do, and he sent out a couple of servants and one of his best soldiers. Okay, so there's Cornelius, he has a vision, send a search party to get Peter, right? So now here we go to Peter. God doesn't want Peter to be alarmed, so put yourself in his place. You have these strangers come to your house that you're not expecting, and one of them is a Roman soldier. Do you get a little antsy, a little afraid at that point? And so God is going to come to Peter. Uh, there's a moment where Peter was hungry, and of course, um, eating and, and having meals prepped in that time, there were no microwaves. There were no instant pots, right? He couldn't just go down the road to McDonald's. He's waiting on food, and he's hungry, and he says, I might as well spend some time in prayer. And so Peter's in prayer, and now Peter gets a vision just like Cornelius. And in this vision in particular, mind you, Peter's hungry, and so here comes this vision. Heaven opens up, and this sheet is lowered down to earth, and the text says, all kinds of four-footed animals, as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice told him, 
get up, Peter, kill, and eat. And all of God's meat-eating people said... Amen. And I'm sorry. We, hey, we love vegetarians too and vegans. If you are there, hey, understand. <laughs> I, I don't remember seeing this verse in the Precious Moments Bible about Peter being told to get up and kill and eat. And I don't remember any VBS memory verses over Acts 10, uh, 20, uh, 12 through 23. So, so Peter, he, he wasn't as enthusiastic about this command to get up and kill and eat. Even though, yes, he's hungry at this time. And why is that? Why isn't he as enthusiastic about this? Well, the Old Testament laws forbade eating the animals that he was just told to get up, kill, and eat. And of course, we know, for instance, pork was one such four-footed animal that Jews didn't eat. And even today, some kosher Jews will not eat pork. And so not only did Peter and, and, his, and his fellow Jews avoid eating pork and these other animals, they avoided contact with people who ate these animals. And they avoided sharing a dinner table with people who ate these animals. So do you see the collision that is about to happen? Jew and Gentile coming together, Peter, Peter and Cornelius. Peter is about to be invited into a Gentile's house to tell him about the gospel of Jesus. And out of hospitality, Cornelius and his family, they will invite Peter into their house and invite him to sit down and eat a meal with them. And the chances are, there's a pretty good chance, they would offer Peter something to eat that he had never eaten before and something that he never imagined he would ever eat in his life. Now, Side note, one of the hallmarks of the early church, the way that they did church, the way that they worshipped, was gathering around a table and feasting. And as a part of that feast, they got bread and they got wine and they celebrated the Lord's Supper. And so it's easy to see how the Christian message, as it spreads from Jews to Gentiles who eat unclean animals, who are unclean, it's easy to understand how this could be a source of division and angst in the early church. And so here's where this wrecking ball comes in and absolutely shatters Peter's long-held beliefs. After being told to get up, kill, and eat, Peter says, surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. Now, I'm sure Peter in this moment was so proud of himself because he probably thought this was just a test of his obedience to God and following the Old Testament laws. But God said this to Peter three times. Get up, kill, and eat. Now, where have we seen three times occur in Peter's life before? Think about this. Think about Peter denying Jesus how many times? And how many times did Jesus then come back to Peter after the resurrection and say, Peter, do you love me? Three times. And so I can imagine at the third time when God says to Peter, Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. Can't you just see the light bulb going off in Peter's head? Three times as he recognizes the voice of Jesus, his rabbi, his dear friend, his Lord, disarming him of his righteous certainty and his misplaced religious zeal. And so as the vision then comes to an end, the search party has now arrived at Peter's house, and they're ready to escort him back to Cornelius' house. And so it's with all of this context in mind, now we read Acts 10, 27 through 48. While talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. This is at Cornelius' house. He said to them, you are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate or visit a Gentile, but God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean, so when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. May I ask why you sent for me? Cornelius answered, three days ago, I was in my house praying at this hour, at three in the afternoon. 
Suddenly a man in shining clothes stood before me and said, Cornelius, God has heard your prayer and remembered your gifts to the poor. Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He is a guest in the home of Simon the Tanner, who lives by the sea. So I sent for you immediately. And it was good of you to come. Now we are all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good things and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a cross, but God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God has appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All of the prophets testify about him, and everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, Surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, and then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. So when Peter traveled to Cornelius's house, the text says that some of Jesus, some of the early Jesus followers, some of the first disciples, went with Peter to, I suspect, they, out of curiosity, wanted to see what was going to happen. Um, they wanted to see if Peter would have his first taste of bacon, perhaps. Would Peter remain unclean in his inter- or remain clean in his interaction with Cornelius and these Gentiles? Would he politely refuse to eat with the Gentiles and at the same time tell them about Jesus? Now, if you'll remember back to Acts chapter two, on the day of Pentecost, when Peter and the other disciples they've received the Holy Spirit, they've been given the ability to speak in new languages, new tongues. They began to go out and preach about Jesus, and as people started repenting and being baptized, the Holy Spirit came on them, and so all of these people started speaking in these new languages, these new tongues. In the book of Acts, we see that this was a very common thing that was sort of a sign and a symbol of receiving the Holy Spirit, that the people in Acts would begin to speak in new tongues. And so the question is, why not now Cornelius and his family? Because the Holy Spirit has come on them. They began to speak in new tongues. And Luke records that when the Holy Spirit fell on even the Gentiles, all who heard the message, they were astonished to see that the Holy Spirit fell even on Cornelius and his friends. The Holy Spirit came even on these unclean people who eat these unclean foods. Isn't it interesting that we're not very far along in the history of the church at this time. And already there are these insiders who are suspicious of outsiders as if the gift of the Holy Spirit, as if the the rite of baptism in water was only for the few and the privileged. Those like me and not those over there who are different from me. And so Peter, he insists in the text Surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. 
And so, I think there are some lessons that Peter and the early Jewish Christians learned in Acts 10 that are relevant for us today. Perhaps there is some deconstruction that needs to occur in our lives just as well. Maybe thoughts and attitudes about peoples in our life and in this world. There is a, a pattern and a tendency sometimes for Christians to want to control the Holy Spirit. To be the ones who dispense grace. We want to be the ones to say how and when and where and really fully understand how God moves and works. And we get nervous sometimes and maybe we get a little offended when the Holy Spirit begins to move and things are happening that I can't take credit for or that you can't take credit for. Or something happens, something good happens, and we can't say that is a result of a five-year strategic planning process. Sometimes the Spirit bypasses all of our best efforts to do some amazing and wonderful things. Like Peter, we are going to have to be willing to follow the Holy Spirit to unfamiliar and to uncomfortable places where we are called to witness and to bear the name of Jesus to people that we would rather not come into contact with. Like Peter, there are some old prejudices and some old ways of thinking about certain people, groups of people that we continually write off as hopelessly lost. So my question for you are, who are those people, maybe? That maybe you write off as beyond God's reach, beyond the love and the grace of God. A little over a year ago, there was a, a, a revival that broke out in uh, the campus, on the campus, of Asbury University in Wilmore, Kentucky. It's a small, private Methodist college in a small town. Wilmore is about a town of probably 6,000 people at most. And it was a revival that made some Christians uncomfortable because there were no famous televangelists or evangelists. There were no famous preachers that were leading the revival. It was not led or organized by one church or one denomination. And even Asbury University, like they didn't claim, like we started this. They just tried their best to host the revival and not get in the way of the Holy Spirit. And it's interesting, this revival started following just a routine chapel service. Just a routine weekly chapel service. Even the preacher who preached that chapel service, he says, I didn't think it was one of my best sermons. And following this chapel service began this 16-day, 24-hour, uninterrupted, just time of, of worship and prayer in the chapel. As students refused to leave the chapel and they prayed and they worshiped, and this carried on for a few days, and word started getting out on social media. And before you knew it, people from Kentucky, and people from the South, and people from the North, and from all around the United States, people from across the world flew to, to Kentucky to be a part of this revival, this Holy Spirit revival on the Asbury campus. They say an estimated 50 to 70,000 people flooded into this small town of 6,000 people. Can you imagine the, 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 the headache with, with, with all of the, the traffic details? There wasn't enough uh, stuff, restaurants and, and things for people as they were coming in. People of all ages, all ethnicities, all denominations, all social and economic statuses gathered as the Holy Spirit was felt in a very special way. And watching from a distance, it was interesting because there were some Christians, some vocal Christians who were threatened by this revival. And they couldn't do anything other than criticize what was going on at Asbury College. Some of them thought, well, this generation, Gen Z, they need a little hellfire and brimstone preaching. And there was none of that. Some of these critics, they looked and they saw that there were Catholics showing up. There were Methodists. There were Baptists, there were Pentecostals, Lutherans, Presbyterians. The whole body of Christ was gathering there at Asbury College in Wilmore, Kentucky. And they were worshiping together, but the critics were saying, this can't be a true revival because they're not discussing and sorting out their theological differences. 
They thought that if, if this is a true revival, then they're coming together and they're saying, you're wrong and I'm right. And none of that was happening. Labels and denominations and all of the other things that we separate ourselves by didn't matter in this revival in Wilmore, Kentucky. What happened in Acts chapter 10 when the Holy Spirit fell on Cornelius and his family was all a part of what Joel prophesied hundreds of years ago in, in Joel 2, where, where God said, I will pour out my spirit on some people. <laughs> I will pour my spirit out on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. My friends, in closing, as time marches on toward an eventual end of this age, and the return of Jesus Christ to make all things new, we would be wise to celebrate what the Holy Spirit is doing. Even if it challenges some of our long-held assumptions, biases, and dogmas. What if, follow me on this for just a moment, what if the beginning of a Holy Spirit revival doesn't begin with what needs to change in them, what if the beginning of a Holy Spirit revival begins with what needs to change in me and in you? Can we say with Peter, I now realize, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. And so, my friends, may all who have ears to hear, hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Let us pray. Lord, we want to be a part of what you're doing in this day and age. There's tur turmoil all, all around our world, around our nation. There's unrest easy to look around and say, man, there's just nothing good going on. Where is God in all of this? Holy Spirit, I pray that you would give us eyes to see what you are currently doing, what you want to do in us, how you want to change us, how you want to light a fire in us how your spirit so badly wants to move within a people who just say, yes, Lord, do what you want to do in our midst. Do what you want to do in our community. Do what you want to do in our small group, in our, in our Sunday school classes, in our Bible studies, in our worship service, in our missions, in our missionaries. Do what you want to do, Holy Spirit. We're yours. Let the revival begin with change in us forward to being a part of what you're doing in these last days. We pray these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people say, Amen.